Of all the organisms we interact with, there is none we have a more love-hate relationship with than bacteria. They cause some of the worst diseases known to mankind, and yet we can't live without them. Whether you want them or not, bacteria are your best friends for life. We are born into this world germ-free. That's right, completely sterile. But with our first breath, we begin to invite into our lives bacteria. When researchers swabbed the insides of babies' mouths just 15 minutes after being born, they found thousands of bacteria already growing inside. By adulthood, bacteria will outnumber human cells in our body 10 to 1. And after we die, bacteria will remain to decompose our bodies. From birth to death, bacteria are our most closely devoted partners. Today, we're going to look at how bacteria thrive. The process by which prokaryotes reproduce is called binary fission, and compared to mitosis in eukaryotes, it's much simpler for a couple of reasons. First, prokaryotes only have one chromosome, that's right, one, and so they don't need a whole bunch of spindle fibers to drag dozens of chromosomes around in the cell. And second, because prokaryotes don't have a nuclear envelope, they don't have to dissolve it to get it out of the way to move uh, their chromosome around. So let's look at the process. We start with a cell uh, that has gone through replication. The first step is making copies of its DNA. We see two copies of the chromosome here. You'll also notice that both of those copies are attached to the membrane. There's a little piece that's sort of hooked onto the membrane, and that will be important in our second step where the membrane grows. And because those two copies were attached to the membrane at different points, the copies get pulled apart. So this kind of does the job of those spindle fibers. The membrane grows, allowing the copies to separate. Uh, once there's enough space between them, uh, the cell simply begins to divide, it grows a cell wall as well, and you have now two identical uh, clones of that original cell. One difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is that prokaryotes have circular DNA. It's a complete circle with no ends. So replication starts at a random point on that circle, and then moves around the circle uh, going in two directions until it meets on the other side and the two copies split off from each other and you have two identical copies of the same DNA. In addition to the main chromosome that all bacteria have, many strains also contain small circular pieces of DNA called plasmids. And while plasmids aren't necessary for life, they often give bacteria enhanced capabilities. For example, Various genes on plasmids are responsible for antibiotic resistance, the widely known phenomenon where bacteria are able to resist the very drugs that we use to try and stop them from reproducing. Okay, so here's a simple question. How many species of bacteria are there in the world? Well, the answer is kind of complex. First of all, it's hard to classify bacteria because many of their traits are not visible, they're chemical, and our methods of sampling species of bacteria aren't as accurate as we would like them to be. But that hasn't stopped us from making an estimate. How many? As many as 100 million to 10 billion species on the planet. Given also the fact that they are the most numerous forms of life, and it's clear that bacteria dominate this world. But this huge amount of genetic diversity also leaves us with a puzzle, because remember, all bacteria are clones. They're genetically identical to their parents. So the question is, if all bacteria are clones, how did so many species evolve? The answer, of course, to our puzzle is mutations. Random changes in DNA that happen in every organism whenever DNA gets copied. Errors are made in the replication process, and those errors can get passed on to the organism's offspring. But mutations alone can't account for 10 billion species of bacteria. Well, we've discovered that bacteria can also spread their mutations to each other in what we would term horizontal gene transfer. Okay, so here's a way of thinking of horizontal gene transfer. Every time an organism reproduces, whether it's a bacterium or a human, traits are passed from parents to offspring. And this could be termed vertical transfer because the information is going down from one generation to the next. But in bacteria, we found that they can transfer genes horizontally. So imagine our green friend here could pass traits on to a second species of bacteria. And that second species picks up traits it didn't have before, like 
the ability to make these little purple fuzzy hairs. Well, this creates a third species of bacteria, and those traits can then be passed vertically to that bacteria's offspring. The first method of gene transfer between bacteria is called transduction, which could be defined as accidental transfer by a virus. This spider robot looking thing is called a bacteriophage, kind of scary, but this virus infects just bacteria. And when it infects bacteria, it can accidentally move genetic material between its hosts. Let's look at how. When a virus lands on a cell, the first thing it does is it injects its own DNA into its host cell. You can see that uh, DNA from the virus going in right there. And we've highlighted also a part of the bacterial chromosome. That brown loop is the chromosome belonging to the bacteria. And within that section that's highlighted there is a gene. We're gonna call this gene A. Keep that one uh, in your mind because we're gonna watch what happens to that as the virus does its thing. Now we're gonna label this cell A+, plus, meaning uh, it simply contains gene A, whatever gene A does. It could be a gene that makes hair for the bacteria, could give it the ability to eat a certain food, could be anything. Now as the virus injects its DNA into the host, it's going to kind of do some nasty business. It's gonna chop up the host cell chromosome into little bits. Then it's going to make copies, you see uh, copies of the viral DNA there, and it's then going to assemble a new army of viruses. Now in making this army, one of these shells, those are called capsids, those gray things you see there, has made a mistake. It has accidentally picked up a piece of bacterial DNA and that could contain our A gene. Now when that virus goes to a new host, what it will do is land on that host and it's pre-programmed to inject whatever nucleic acid is in its head into the host cell. So you see this brown piece coming in here that is bacterial DNA. Now the chromosome of this new cell, which might be a different species, can absorb that bacterial DNA. We'll say it doesn't have the A gene, so it's an A minus cell. But by absorbing that gene, it now contains new DNA that it didn't have before. So this allows bacteria to gain new traits that they might not have. Prokaryotes have been reproducing asexually for billions of years, and they're pretty darn successful at it but that hasn't stopped them from trying to partake of some of the fun of sexual reproduction. The closest they've ever gotten, conjugation, our second form of gene transfer. In conjugation, a cell, which we label plus, has the ability to make a mating bridge called a sex pillus with a, another bacteria that can't make sex pili, which we label minus. A sex pillus is basically like a little tube, and through that tube, the plus bacteria can send copies of its plasmids uh, to the minus bacteria. And these plasmids can contain genes for things like the ability to make sex pili, which will change this one from a minus into a plus, but the plasmids can also contain genes for other traits like antibiotic resistance. The third and final kind of gene transfer among bacteria is called transformation. And a simple definition of transformation would be cells absorbing naked DNA from their surroundings. Naked meaning there's no covering like a membrane or a nucleus around that DNA. Uh, this cell on the left has died. And in the process of it dying, its DNA has broken down, formed, uh, you see here, small fragments. Uh, some of those fragments, like this one here, have made contact with a nearby living cell. The cell uh, here is still alive. And that DNA uh, can be absorbed into the cytoplasm of the cell and become incorporated into the cell's genome, thereby giving it new traits. You may recall that transformation was, was first shown by Frederick Griffith, who worked with uh, two different strains of pneumonia bacteria. He had this harmless strain that didn't cause the disease and this more deadly harmful one uh, that did. And what he did was he heat killed these, so these cells were dead. Uh, some of their DNA had leaked out into the environment and the uh, harmless strain absorbed some of that DNA and was able to incorporate into its genome. And when he injected those uh, mixed dead cells and living uh, harmless cells together, he found that the mice uh, did contract pneumonia. Uh, transformation is also something that is very commonly carried out in bacterial labs where we get bacteria to take up uh, plasmids or other pieces of DNA. And one way to do that is to heat shock them. 
uh, heat sort of loosens up the membranes and allows uh, the cells to absorb DNA more easily. If you take together transformation, conjugation, and transduction, that adds up to a lot of bacterial diversity. And prokaryotes have been doing this for three and a half billion years, making them the most successful and prolific organisms on this planet. Well, that does it for us here at CV Biology. And remember, the best thing about science is the sharing.